If we look at this graph at the top, we are taking a transect from inside a reserve to outside of the reserve, and we're looking at the forest cover. And what you find is in places like the Amazon, if you set up a national park, there's forest inside and there's forest outside. That's because the parks are so remote that it doesn't matter where you put them, the land will still be protected. Parks work um, de facto by their isolation. But if you look at areas where there are more people, parks still work to maintain forest cover. The graph on the right shows us forest cover inside a reserve and outside a reserve. Reserves work de jure too, that people actually obey the boundaries of national parks to a large extent. So if we set up parks are going to work. If you look at this map, it's an area about the size of half the continental United States. It's about 5 million square kilometers. The red are all the places that fires occur. We measure fires every night from satellite images flying over Brazil. The dark areas are protected areas. They're mostly indigenous reserves. And you can see that indigenous reserves are not where fires are. Indigenous reserves work to keep out the people who would burn the forest. That's where destruction is. It's essentially where the fires are. So if we set up protected areas, we know that they work. And we know that indigenous people who have rights to their own land, by and large, want to contain the forest, preserve the forest, and, and preserve their traditional way of life. This image here, which is about a thousand miles across the huge swath of the Amazon, is a satellite image taken on the 15th of August, 1999. It was one of the worst fire days Brazil has ever had. I flew over that area on that particular day. And these smudgy brown things, these white, these white areas are clouds. But all that brown muck are smoke plumes. Huge amounts of the Amazon goes up in smoke. And when you fly across the Amazon in August, um, you often can't see the ground because of the smoke. And some of these smoke plumes tower 40,000 feet up into the atmosphere. They're huge. And they go downwind, those smoke plumes above my finger, go downwind several hundred miles. These are huge fires. In the last year, Brazil has reduced its deforestation by two-thirds. I got the opportunity through National Geographic, for whom I blog. Please read my blogs on National Geographic. I got my opportunity to interview the Brazilian Environment Minister, Carlos Mink. The top picture is areas um, where there were fires in 2008, 2009, you know, the darker the red, the more the, more the deforestation. You can see that to, to the forest year that ended in 2009, Brazil reduced its deforestation massively. I asked Minister Mink, how did they do it? He had two answers. The first was good science. Brazil has a very credible, very competent space agency that monitors deforestation so they know where forests have been cut. And better enforcement. Much of the logging that takes place in the Amazon is, is illegal. And with a billion dollar promise from Norway through a program called RED, Reduced Emissions from Deforestation and Forest Degradation, and Norway has had the resources to massively slow its deforestation. At Copenhagen, um, the United States promised a billion dollars to aid programs like this. It's appropriations time on the Hill. I was there last week. We have a climate bill 
that is being developed. It's important for us to keep that promise at Copenhagen, to make sure that we pay a billion dollars. It's the cheapest way of offsetting carbon emissions. It's transparent, and we know from these studies that it's effective. What of the future? As I said before, a large component of greenhouse gas emissions is tropical deforestation. It's also the single biggest contributor to species loss. A hectare of forest contains about 150 tons of carbon. If you burn that forest, it will go into the atmosphere. And burning tropical forests puts out more than a billion tons of carbon every year. Begin to sound like Carl Sagan, you know, billions and billions of tons. <laughs> Equally, over the last 50 years, we have cleared 7 million square kilometers of tropical forest. 2 million of it has gone for crops. Understand that cropland is valuable. But 5 million has gone to wretched cattle pasture where, as in the photograph at the top, that poor bloody cow is starving to death. This is really wretched land. And the project I talked to you about in Brazil through my organization, Saving Species, seeks to provide examples of how we can buy degraded cattle pasture, and in doing so, reforest it and soak up the carbon. If we could do that over the five million square kilometers of bad, degraded land, we would be soaking up huge quantities of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. In other words, saving species and saving the climate go hand in hand. We can save species. We can do that by empowering local conservation groups. We can do that by empowering indigenous groups so that they have control over their future. And we can pay for the services that Mother Nature provides. It just so happens I have my banker in the audience. Roger, please hold your hand up. Thank you. Uh, Roger, um, who works for me at Saving Species and manages the PIM Group, which is our website, accepts all major currencies, the credit cards, keys to expensive cars, you know, and all the other kinds of tradable currencies. So I'm sure Laurie is going to be telling you momentarily about how you can support her, but I can have a commercial too. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>